policy advice to all the stakeholders, to the government or anyone who's uh, interacting with us. We have been working in the last five years after in 2018 on various policy issues with the government in India, with Niti Aayog, with UN Escape and other institutions across the world, both in the private sector and the government sector. We have been very lucky. We have had a rare blend of foreign scholars and Indian scholars speaking to us on contemporary economic, both domestic and global. We have been also fortunate to have had three Nobel laureates come and speak to us. And we have also participated actively in the G20 uh, deliberations. We worked with one of the think tanks on the new international economic order. We also worked on women empowerment and on climate. In that sense, we feel very fulfilled that we have the objective of research-based policy advice and we are bringing the best researchers, scholars from across the world to come and speak about contemporary economic issues. One of the most contemporary economic issue in the last year has been poverty. What is the story on poverty? In India, this is a very important topic. Various studies have come up and recently we had results of the consumption expenditure survey. Again, the issue came up. The multiple, the multi-poverty index has also been occupying lots of policy space in our country. We have had series of presentations on multidimensional poverty as well as the uh, consumption expenditure survey. We are concluding that series of discussions with these two, with Professor Nanak Kakwani. The one we had last week, we had the privilege of listening to Dr. Nanak Kakwani, who gave a summary from 1901. And then we had Sabina Alkire to give it the, she brings in the latest on the multidimensional poverty and she was here with us. In India, we have also been worried and working a lot on poverty. In our own country, Dr. Surjit Bhalla has been working on it for many years, and Dr. Arvind Virmani has also been working on it for many years. Today, we are working again on the same topic with Dr. Nanak Kakwani being the main speaker, Dr. Arvind Virmani chairing it, and Dr. Surjit Bhalla being a discussant. All the three speakers actually do not need any introduction. They are extremely popular, well known with their expertise in their own areas. So I'm going to be very, very brief in their introduction. Dr. Virmani right now is serving as the member of Nitya Yog. We are very proud to say before he became the member of Nitya Yog, he was the chairman of the Foundation for Economic Growth and Welfare and had been guiding us into research-based policy advice. He has been earlier with the Planning Commission for many years. He was the chief economic advisor of our country. He has published extensively in policy research. He was also actively participating in the reforms in our country in 1991. And he has also been on the Reserve Bank's Monetary Policy Committee. He has extensive all-round knowledge on how the Indian economy works, and he has published extensively on Indian economy also. At EGRO, we have his latest publication where he is discussing about 2050 and way forward. Nanak Kirkwani, Professor Nanak Kirkwani was my professor at UNSW Sydney when I was doing my PhD from 93 to 97. He has been playing an active role in UNSW. He has also been visiting professor of economics at the China Institute for Income Distribution at Beijing uh, Normal University, China. At New South Wales, he was president of econometrics for 30 years from 1970 to 2000. He was chief economist and director of the UNDP International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth in Brazil from 2004 to 
to 2006. His main research has focused on poverty, income inequalities, pro-poor growth, taxation, public policies, human development, and social welfare. He has also extensively published in leading international journals. Dr. Surjit Bhalla is the discussant for the day. He's, a, he's been an economist all his life. He's a senior India analyst for the Observatory Group, New York, based macroeconomic policy advisory firm and chairman of Fox's Research and Investments. In team, he was appointed as member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He has been a member of the Secondary Markets Advisory Committee of SEBI and the National Statistical Commission of India. He writes extensively. He was until recently the executive director at the International Monetary Fund, where he wrote a seminal paper talking about India's poverty, India government's COVID related policies, and how we have been able to ensure that many more people do not slip into poverty as happened in other parts of the world during COVID. With this, brief introduction of the three, I hand over the session to our chairman, Dr. Arvind Virmani, to conduct the proceedings further. At the end of the session, Dr. Ashok Vishandas will be providing the concluding remarks and the way forward for the next week. With this, uh, Dr. Virmani, sir, over to you. Thank you, uh, Charan. Uh, so, we, as this is the second in a series and we've uh, already been through one session, I will just call on uh, Professor Kakwani. Uh, I, I hope we can uh, uh, kind of stick to the time. I don't know what time uh, Professor wants, maybe 40 minutes or and then maybe 20 minutes for the discussion. But anyway, over to you, Professor Kakwani. Oh, thank you, Arvin, very much. And I'm glad that you are chairing this session again. And I'm also happy that Surjit Bhalla is going to be the discussion today. So I'm very happy about that. Now, last time I talked about poverty, multidimensional uh, poverty indices. So this time I will be linking the idea of poverty and inequality with economic growth. After all, economic growth provides the, you know, all the uh, prosperity to the country and then how we use it to achieve shared prosperity. So that will be my topic today. So. Uh, why is not changing my screen or oh, screen? I have to press. Huh? Oh, okay. No okay, okay. 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 Uh, okay, it's fine. Yeah, okay. So let me begin with, you know, economic growth, as you know already, generates the goods and services in the economy, which we characterized as economic pie, which needs to be enlarged to achieve total prosperity. Total prosperity includes the economic means generated by economic growth that contribute to people's standard of living or well-being. Now, pie distribution determines how the population shares the pie. If pie is shared equitably, we may call it shared prosperity. So our ultimate social objective is to achieve shared prosperity. Now, interestingly, economists are deeply divided about how we achieve shared prosperity. Some believe that society must focus on policies to enlarge the pie first, and then we should have a policy to divide the pie equitably. So the belief is that Expanding the pie size and dividing the pie are mutually exclusive. Actually, I don't share with this view. 
I believe that two phenomena are growth and its distribution are interrelated. Simultaneous outcomes of the economic processes. The actual impact depending on many factors, including what policies we adopt. Actually, I remember uh, reading that there was a big debate between uh, Amit Sen and Jagdish Bhagwati about you know growth and the distribution. The debate was that the Bhagwati and uh, group they were accusing Sen for not paying much attention to growth, mainly on the distribution. Where the Sen was arguing that that he was uh, paying the attention to growth, but also more importantly on the distribution. So this, you know, debate, you know, seems to be that it's futile to me because they are not mutually exclusive, these two, two things, you know. Both are the outcomes of the same process, you know. So I think we should not go into the debate of that, but in this presentation, I will be linking the two, the distribution as well as economic growth. So then we, we from there, we uh, talk about shared prosperity, which is the outcome of these two factors. Okay, so, so shared prosperity consists of two items, two components. The total prosperity generated by economic growth, or you may call it average prosperity, and how it is distributed among people. So this combination of those, these two uh, factors uh, constitute shared prosperity. Now, concept of shared prosperity sounds very simple, but it can be high com highly complex because it can be measured in infinite number of ways because you can distribute the pie in infinite number of ways. So there will be infinite indicators of shared prosperity. So, which is not very useful to have infinite number of, you know, uh, indices of shared prosperity, then we have to restrict them. And how do we restrict them? Uh, I decided to restrict them by two development goals. Pro-poor growth, inclusive growth, pro-poor development, and inclusive development. So these are the four, instead of having infinite number of you know, possibilities, uh, I, I'm linking, uh, I'm trying to capture the idea of distribution by these four uh, development goals. So these four goals are the alternative characterization of shared prosperity. So in this presentation, I define these goals and provide a methodology provide a I, I'll define these different goals and provide a methodology to measure them. And then I will also uh, apply it so that I want to show you that the methodology I'm talking about can be applied to real world, world data. So what I did is collected the data uh, from World Development Report um, on, uh, on different indicators uh, for 173 countries. So in this application, I am using countries, you know, each country, you know, both developed countries and developing countries as a unit of analysis. Ideally, we should have a unit of analysis at individual level, but, but we cannot do that uh, globally uh, using 173 countries. So we, I'm using it, applying it, uh, the poor countries and rich countries, developing countries are developed countries. And so countries are the units of analysis, but methodology 
can be applied to individual level using household surveys. For instance, in India has national sample surveys, so we can use national sample surveys to capture shared prosperity. Then I also try to uh, apply this methodology to Indian data, but again, same limitation that I'm using state as a unit of analysis because we, I could not get access to the individual surveys, but we could get the data for each, each state. So the results which I'm presenting are at the state level, that whether poor, poor states or richer states who are performing better, uh, who have a pro-poor growth or inclusive growth and, and so on. So this is a limitation, but, but some people using in India, you can use this methodology to go deeper and do the analysis at individual level. Now, the now point I want to make is that in the, India was one of the first countries in the world, maybe the first countries in the world, which adopted inclusive growth as a as this development agenda, development policy in uh, India. Our development strategy. So India were the first countries, and then they gave a lot of policies which, which they hoped will up, uh, achieve inclusive growth. But interestingly, they did not define the inclusive growth precisely. Uh, actually, I was reading uh, Hanumanta Rao, he is a legend economist in India. He, in his article, he was writing that inclusive growth is an elusive concept. So, so, but now I don't think it is elusive. I'm going to define it and also measure it. You may not agree with my definition, but let's see, you know, we can have a debate about whether I'm using the correct definitions of inclusive growth and poor growth, you know. So, proper growth and inclusive growth, they are related concepts. The proper growth is more fo focused on the poor, and inclusive growth is focused, is a broad based growth focused on the whole population. Okay, so. So. Now, another point I want to make in this presentation is that there are two approaches to measure shared prosperity. There can be two approaches. Are two approaches to measure economic growth. One is called relative approach, another is called absolute approach. Now, relative approach, you know, uh, we, you know, we have just, I've been observing uh, India's economic growth recently, last quarter. They were expecting, they, they achieved the growth rate of 8.4% in India, annual growth rate of 8.4%. So we call this 8.4% is a relative approach to measuring growth. It shows, the 8.4% means this shows that India's average real income is increasing at an annual rate of 8.4%. So every year, annual rate, 8.4% is the increase in uh, prosperity or standard of living, whatever you call it. And alternatively, we may also measure economic growth as a contribution to increase in people's annual real income by saying, say, in particular year, Instead of saying it is increased by 8.4%, we can say that, say, increased by 20,000 20, rupees uh, per person per year is increasing. So this, this is called the absolute approach to economic growth. So the distinction is very clear. That's relative approach and absolute approach. Let me tell you that these two approaches they can give you quite opposite results. Supposing there are two persons, A and B, A has an income of 100 
100 rupees are 100 dollars 100 rupees are 100 dollars and b has a income of 1000 rupees suppose we have a policy that gives 15 rupees to the poor and 105 rupees to the rich so the poor person a gains 15% of income and b gains 10.5% of the income so it means that in relative terms poorer person benefits more than the richer person its benefit is 15% and the richer person's benefit is only 10.5% so we call this policy as relative pro poor but in absolute terms the richer person a gains seven times more income than the poorer person his gain is 105 rupees rather than you know 105 rupees where the poor person is only uh, 15 rupees so which means that the richer person is getting seven times more income than the poorer person which means that richer person can uh, buy seven times more goods and services for consumption than the poorer person so i so you can see that in relative terms poorer person is doing better but in absolute terms richer person is doing better so we are getting two quite opposite results so what I'm message is that how we measure economic growth matters. Almost all economists measure economic growth in relative terms, except me, of course. You know, the absolute con concept can be also appealing because most people may understand the absolute concept better than the relative concept they tend to understand better how much additional goods and services they can buy with additional income they get from the growth. Similarly, if there's a recession, then people can also assess how much consumption of goods and services they have to sacrifice. So these two co concepts, I mean, they, you know, I don't take any side that one is better than the other, but these are two alternative concepts and and we should consider them you know that absolute approach is also uh, uh, intuitively uh, quite interesting so we can measure shared prosperity in both relative and absolute terms so i will present the empirical results in both relative and absolute terms okay so now i will give a precise definition of what is pro-poor growth and what is inclusive growth. Now, again, there are two definitions of pro-poor growth, a relative definition and absolute definition. Let me first deal with the relative approach. If the average relative growth is positive, the growth process is pro-poor if it benefits the poor proportionally more than the non-poor, proportionally. But if growth is negative, the growth process is pro-poor if the proportional loss of income from negative growth is less for the poor than for the non-poor. Then in the case of recession, if poor suffers proportionally uh, less than non-poor, non then, then growth is pro-poor. Now, this definition I gave as early as in 2000, you know, uh, Kakwani and Pernia, the title of the paper is What is Pro-Poor Growth? And that paper has attracted a lot of attention. So now I absolute, in 2008, Kakwani and Son, you know, we, we propose, uh, absolute approach that paper is on poverty equal and growth rate so absolute definition is similar if the absolute growth is positive the growth process is pro poor if the poor enjoy greater absolute benefits from 
growth than the non-poor. And when growth is negative, the growth process is absolute pro-poor. If absolute loss of income from negative growth is less for the poor than for the non-poor. So, so these are the. This is a basic definition of pro-poor growth, and I use social welfare function framework to measure them. So, social welfare function. I'll use the social welfare function as a tool to define both pro-poor and inclusive growth. To measure pro-poor growth, our entire focus is on the poor. And so we construct the poverty social welfare function. I mean, these are new, this is the new idea, the poverty social welfare function. And similarly, uh, to measure inclusive growth, we define uh, inclusive social welfare function. Okay, so these are the two uh, social welfare functions I will be using. Now, let me go to inclusive growth, which has been called as an uh, elusive concept. The pro-poor growth is deliberately bi biased in the favor of the poor, and its primary pur purpose is to rapidly reduce poverty. So we develop a framework for pro-poor growth employing poverty social welfare function, assigning entire weight to the poor, okay? Non-poor, we do give zero weight, which means that society is only concerned about the poor and has no concern about what happens to the non-poor. Okay, now in contrast, inclusive growth is broad based, you know, so that its social welfare function gives positive weight to everyone in the society. You know, we don't ignore anybody, everybody. Uh, so idea of inclusive growth is that everybody should be able to participate in growth process and benefit from it. So, for instance, you know, let me give you an example. If the growth results in high inequality, means that some people receive excessive benefits and others receive very bigger benefits. So, we do not, cannot call it as an inclusive growth. The inclusive growth must be equitable, leading to higher growth benefits to poor person, but Social welfare function is equitable if weight given to each person. Or let me let me explain further. You know differently. You know that that in, inclusive. We use inclusive social welfare function. So we inclusive growth is broad based, where we care about that everybody should participate in the growth process and benefit from this. So which means that. Inclusive social welfare function gives positive weights to everyone in the society. Whereas in pro poor growth, we give positive weights only to the poor and zero weights to the non poor. So that is the distinction between the two. But also, the inequality should not be there because when you have high inequality, it means that everybody is not able to participate in the growth process and therefore. Uh, they are not benefiting from that, so it's not inclusive. So it means that inclusive growth must be equitable, leading to higher growth benefits to the to to everybody. You know, so we have to bring equity in the social welfare function to avoid this uh, the increasing inequality. You know. I, you know, give you an example. This America, there was a debate about one percent, but top one percent and bottom uh, ninety-nine percent. One percent against ninety-nine percent. You must have heard about the debate in in USA. An idea was that over 30, 40 years, they found that the benefits of growth going to one percent were almost three hundred times 
the benefits going to the bottom 99%. So that's why, you know, that, so such a growth, we cannot call it as inclusive growth. It's not a broad-based growth because benefits are only going to the top 1% and 99% are getting much, much lower uh, uh, benefits from the growth. So, so that is the idea of inclusive growth that, that everybody should be benefit, uh, should benefit from economic growth. Uh, they should participate and benefit from it. Okay. And now I, I return to, you know, the literature. Uh, you know, if a country achieves high economic growth, it is applauded as a country with a high level of development. You know, economic growth is measured in income space, which provides people with the means to lead better life. But means are necessary, but insufficient to give people quality of life. So, okay, then, you know, uh, but the literature does not make distinction between, uh, you know, the development and growth, growth and development, you know, because development and growth, they are, uh, kind of, you know, mixed, mixed up to each, each other. They all call it development, you know, but I make the distinction that development is concerned with the well-being and measured in well-being space, whereas growth is measured in income space. It is focused on income or it is focused on means. And I see well-being is the end. These are the ultimate achievements of the uh, people in a, in a country. So, the, so this is a distinction between the two. And well-being, I have followed the concept developed by Amartya Sen of functionings and capabilities. So his idea of development has to be, is concerned with the kind of life people can lead, what can they can or cannot do, for example, whether they are well nourished or get an education or able to escape avoidable morbidity or mortality. So this is the idea that, that I'm making distinction between the two. You know, the development is different from economic growth. Development is concerned with ends and, and economic growth is concerned with the means. So this is the idea I'm using. So, so, so given this, I have two, two further concepts, pro-poor development and pro-poor, uh, pro-poor development and inclusive development. So these are, the, so that's why I had a four development goals, uh, pro-poor growth, in, inclusive growth, a proper development and inclusive development. Okay. So let me again define define now the proper and inclusive development. So we have a relative proper development, relative and absolute. The poor enjoy poor enjoy a proportionally higher increase in well-being than the non-poor then it is pro-poor. And absolute pro-poor development, the poor enjoy absolutely higher well-being than the non-poor in absolute terms and one is a relative terms. Similarly, inclusive growth, relative inclusive development, the well-being is relatively equitable distributed, uh, if relatively equitably distributed across the entire population, then it is uh, inclusive development and absolute development and absolute inclusive development is well-being is absolutely equitably distributed across the entire population. So this is all the definitions uh, I, I will be, I'm introducing in this lecture. So now how to measure them, you know? So we have a social welfare function framework. Uh, this, so what I do, how to find out the social welfare function, uh, which is appropriate to measure these four development goals. Hmm? So first is that social welfare function 
is defined in the case of many persons in the economy, you know, the, not the one person, but, you know, most of the economic, a lot of economic analysis was done before, assuming that there's one, uh, one individual in the economy and we measure the well-being or, you know, the standard of living of the one person. But, but here, social welfare function means that we are taking into account the incomes are well being are, you know, standard of living of everyone in the society. So, so social welfare function, which I call it, you know, X star, and which is the function of all people in the economy. You know, there are N people in the economy, so X1, X2, and Xn. And they are arranged in the ascending order of the uh, income. So, the X1 is the poorest person and Xn is the richest person in the society. So there are four actions which I'm proposing. One is the relative homogeneity that it means that if everybody's income is increased in the same proportion, then social welfare function also increases or decreases by the same proportion. Now this axiom is essential in the derivation of relative measure of shared prosperity. Similarly, we have absolute homogeneity. If all incomes are increased or decreased by same absolute amount, then social welfare function is also increased or decreased by the same amount. So, so this is essential to measure absolute sh shared prosperity. And then axiom three is that the social welfare function is invariant to any positive linear transformation. It implies that social welfare function is measured in money metric terms, in the units of income, dollars or rupees, you know. So, and then fourth is that social welfare function should be equitable. Uh, equity, we should introduce equity. Uh, that we, equity means that the weight de keeps decreasing, you know, the poorest person, the most deprived person gets the highest weight and the richest person gets the uh, lowest weight. So, and also, I measure relative economic growth by percentage change in the mean income of the people. I mean, you can, mean income can be a proxy for per capita GDP, uh, but I would prefer mean income because mean income uh, and GDP is also a very, very elusive concept, you know, it in, you know, it's the total goods and services uh, produced in the economy. But here, uh, when we are talking about relative economic growth, we are focusing on the mean incomes of uh, everybody in the society. And similarly, we can have a, uh, absolute economic growth, the gap between the mean income, you know, the different years, you know, uh, how much is the mean income increasing in real in real terms okay so so these are the technical things i don't need to go into this uh, this is the social welfare function which satisfies all my axioms mm -hmm. okay but only some thing i want to tell you is that k you know k is a uh, uh, the inequality aversion parameter, It means that higher the value of K, the greater importance you are giving to the poor persons. For instance, if you are measuring pro poor growth, if K is higher, it goes higher, then we are focusing more on extreme poverty, not just the poverty, but extreme poverty. So, so K is, you know, that you, you get a different social welfare functions, but in my illustrations, I have used K is equal to one and two. So, so similarly, inclusive growth here, you know, in previous social welfare function, all the weight was given uh, to, to the poor, but now when we have inclusive social welfare function, then all, everybody in the society gets a positive weight, positive weight, so the total weight adds up to one. So again, here also we have a same parameter, inequality aversion parameter, K. So K relates to the whole population, inequality aversion parameter, and in case of the pro-poor growth, 
in poverty social welfare function k relates to the poor only okay okay now i give you some illustration uh, uh, global illustration uh, again i point out that again as i pointed out already that i'm using countries as a uh, units of analysis not the individuals you know but if you have a data and if some researchers can go into individual countries right but here we are getting the picture of between countries so the disparities or whatever it is it's between the countries so per capita gdp is measured in 200 and uh, 2017 PPP purchasing power parity so that you can compare the incomes of per capita GDP of different countries, you know, if they are uh, expressed in the same year of PPP. So let me explain this table. These are the average growth rates of, you know, this is just an illustration. I mean, this is not a complete study. Huh? So here we see that per capita GDP in 217 PPP huh, is, so relative growth rate is 2.220. Another thing let me point out is that every year when you are talking about economic growth, there are many fluctuations, you know, the economic growth is fluctuating over time. So we have to focus on the trend growth rate, you know, which is the most sensible thing to do. You cannot, you know, uh, you know, the fluctuating growth rates don't make sense in your trying to measure uh, the growth process in, in a period, you know. So here I'm period is 2001 to 2020. So these are the trend growth rates. So here you can see that per capita GDP, trend growth rate in per capita GDP it has been growing relatively in 2.2% per annum. But in absolute terms, it is increasing every year, 286 PPP dollars. So, so the difference is that one is the PPP dollars, absolute, when you are measuring absolute growth, and when you are measuring relative growth is percentage 2.20%. Similarly, life expectancy at birth which is a indicator uh, very useful indicator so the relative approach is that life expectancy at annual rate of increasing at 0.41 percent whereas in terms of absolute life expectancy it is increasing at 0.29 years of life 0.29 or 0.3 years of life Similarly, infant survival rate, relative terms is 0.13%, and in absolute terms, it is 1.21 uh, uh, rate per thousand of the population is increasing. And similarly, you have a maternal survival rate. So this is the, just an illustration, but you can go into deeper and have more, more indicators. Now, I'll see whether the growth in the world has been pro-poor or uh, anti-poor or inclusive or non-inclusive. Now, the point I'm making, the, when you are measuring whether the growth is pro-poor or anti-poor, anti when it is pro-poor, we gain in growth rate. That's a very intuitive idea in, in, you know, in the in development of my methodology that that when there's a gain in the growth rate of social welfare function, then we say it is pro-poor. And when there's a loss, it is anti-poor. So you can see the figure one. Uh, there, I have used the two po poverty social welfare function, which has a inequality aversion parameter of one and two. So you can see that uh, there's a, uh, gain in 1.78% uh, gain in, in growth rate, which means that growth in relative terms is pro poor in the world. What does it mean? It means that, that 
poorer countries, developing countries are growing faster than the richer countries. And that is why we are getting the gain, gain in the pro poor growth. And how do we define pro poor growth? How, how do we define the poverty line of identifying the poor countries? We have assumed that, that you know, following the World Bank definition, that uh, uh, we rank the countries uh, in ascending order of their per capita GDP, and then bottom 40% belong to the poor and top 60% belong to the non-poor. So you can see here that poorer countries are growing at a faster rate than the non-poor countries. You know, the growth is, there's a gain in growth rate. Similar, but if you look at the uh, absolute figures, the trend in growth rates, the richer countries are growing faster. You know, there's a loss of growth rate. You say, first, say, dollar $1.77, oh, $177, uh, per year, and in case of uh, uh, second uh, social welfare function gain is uh, 205, uh, loss is 205, which means that poorer, the extreme poor countries are suffering more, more than, the, than the poor countries. So it's an interesting result here that growth in the world, global growth is pro-poor in relative terms, but, but it is anti-poor in absolute terms. I mean, this is a, you know, I don't know, you can, I can see the intuition also the why it is happening because poor countries tend to be in relative terms, tend to grow faster. Hmm? I mean, you can see, you know, you can observe the data in the, in the world that, that growth rate, you know, the rich countries, the, Growth rate is, you know, between two to, you know, uh, between one percent or zero percent to maximum of four percent in developed countries. But in poor countries, now India is growing at eleven point four percent, you know, uh, which is very high. India is a poor country, but its growth is eleven point four percent, you know. So generally, the relative terms growth is uh, pro poor, but in absolute terms, rich countries are growing faster. Like you know, the gap between, absolute gap between poor and rich countries is widening, you know, but relative, uh, relatively, the gap is narrowing. Similarly, same story comes out for inclusive growth, that growth is inclusive, relatively, and it is, is, is anti, is non-inclusive in, when we uh, measure the growth by absolute uh, absolute way. Okay. Similarly, uh, let's see the development, you know, the relative pro poor development and inclusive development. You can see that all indicators are showing gain in the in the growth rates of well being, you know, in life expectancy at birth, infant survival, survival rate, or maternity survival rates. So, development in total development in global development actually is pro poor as well as inclusive you know, in in the world you know so so why it well, you, you must be surprised that why it is happening uh, that why the, the well being indicators are uh, growing uh, faster rate than in in poorer countries than in the richer countries the idea is that when you I actually this is the paper I wrote about you know in Journal of Development Economics that that when you are you are well being is at low level of uh, uh, low level then increasing is much easier than you are at the higher level. Let me give you an example. For instance, if you want to increase life expectancy at birth from say sixty to sixty five years. That scenario is much easier than if you want to increase your life expectancy at birth from 80 to 85 years. Uh, even 85 years to 90 years will be even more difficult, infinitely more difficult, you know. So this is the idea I gave in that paper in, in uh, development economics paper published in 1993. So this is the you know, global story, but let me go to the Indian story. 
Indian story again, the same thing is we are talking about here uh, state level. So growth pattern in India indicates that growth has been neither pro poor not inclusive. Now, India has achieved sustained, sustained growth rate for two decades, generating total prosperity, but this prosperity is not shared equitably by all states. You know, I mean, this is a very, very important point to make, but I think still I would say that these are the preliminary results and people have to go uh, much deeper and, you know, uh, and do more study. But this result shows that in contrast to the same methodology I have used for the global and India, India is even performing worse than when the global uh, growth rates. Okay, uh, I will, uh, is, now I'll discuss some policies because the welfare, I have given the social welfare functions uh, framework. Now the policies, you know, that India, there are many policies, you know, uh, you know, policy for the poor uh, to achieve inclusive growth. There are cocktails of policies. You know, if you read the Indian literature, you will find that there are many, many policies. They, they, but they are not connected directly with the pro poor growth or inclusive growth. So this framework which I am presenting before you allows you to connect the policies and link the policies with these development goals. For instance, let me say that individuals drive their income from various sources, such as the labor income, public and private transfers, interest, dividends, profits, income, self-employment, farm and farm and non-farm income, and et cetera. So these income sources have different impact on people's living conditions. The framework presented enables measuring the effect of varying income sources on shared prosperity. For instance, government taxes and expenditure policies are formulated based on various income sources. So using this framework, government can drive optimum policies to achieve shared prosperity. For instance, we want to know how much is GST contributing to pro poor or inclusive growth? So if you, 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 you can, using the income sources or you can have expenditure sources instead of income use expenditures, you can measure exactly the effect of GST on whether growth is pro poor, GST is contributing to pro poor growth or inclusive growth. So this is very interesting to somebody, I hope that somebody in India will take up, I can give the formulae and methodology to connect these policies uh, with pro poor and inclusive growth. Now labor market, most of the people earn their income from labor market. So, so to explain the pattern of shared growth, we have derived a dynamic decomposition, which quantifies the effects of labor market variables on the shared prosperity. So how, you know, suppose you generate employment rate, employment, uh, hours of work um, per employed person, uh, labor force participation rate, and labor productivity, and labor productivity can be explained by years of schooling, uh, return of edu returns from education, which directly impact the social prosperity. Actually, I, I did this work for Brazil, because as you know that Brazil is a country of high inequality, it used to be high inequality, but now since 2000, the inequality has been declining there very rapidly, you know, from, it was about, uh, Gini index was about 60%. It has now come down to 50%. So I was in Brazil. So I took a challenge that what to, how to explain uh, this decline, you know, in, uh, in inequality. So I, I used this uh, decomposition uh, to see how, what was the effect on uh, in growth or inclusive growth or inequality. 
So I found very interesting that employment did not contribute significantly to, to economic growth or proper growth or inclusive growth. Social policies did not contribute because their you know, magnitude was very small. Labor participation rate also was not very helpful, but labor productivity was the key thing. Labor productivity is explained by years of schooling and, and education. So I found that that one reason the inequality was decreasing was that Brazil expanded its education level for unskilled people, and also their productivity went up, their schooling, years of schooling went up, and that had impact on inequality, not the, not the social programs, not employment, uh, you know, but only uh, this uh, labor productivity, you know, that was the contributing factor. Similarly, another application I'm talking about, I'm thinking about the discrimination based on gender, religion, caste, and ethnicity may exclude many social groups from participating in growth. So in India, for instance, the caste system plays a key role in excluding some social groups, such as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, from participating in the growth process. So we, we can target such groups so that they are able to participate in the growth process and earn decent earnings. So what I'm doing is that I'm linking the social groups with shared prosperity, that how much each social group contributes to shared prosperity. So, so contribution of social groups to the shared prosperity is very interesting and somebody, I hope that somebody in India work on this issue because there are many social groups which are very deprived, say gender, uh, you know, people living in rural and urban areas, you can form social groups in many, many ways, you know. Uh, uh, you can have a social groups by age, you know, that how elderly have the impact on proper growth or inclusive growth. So elderly policies, age, uh, gender, uh, caste, religion, regions, you know, state level, you know, how they are contributing. So all these things can be done. So what I'm proposing is that if somebody, but you need, you know, uh, national sample surveys to, to connect all these policies to shared prosperity. So, so linking the policy, just, you know, Proposing policies, you know, it's, it's no use, you know, just say, okay, we generate employment, therefore it will achieve inclusive growth, you know, but how much it will increase, how much is the cost of the employment uh, generating uh, process. So these are the things, you know, uh, but here you can go directly and link the, uh, uh, all these policies with shared prosperity. So maybe, uh, I'll stop today, you know, I won't linger on too, too long, because I have some formulas I've derived, but I'm not going to discuss all these policies today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Surjit, are you there, Dr. Bala? Yeah. yeah. Do you? Uh, you have a PowerPoint? Hello? No, I don't have, no. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so, First, I want to say that, you know, it's a real honor and pleasure uh, to be talking on Nanak's paper. Uh, I've known him, we've known each other for, I guess, the last 40 years or so. And one, you know, uh, point I want to make is that his, it was his framework for how you can, if you have just the share of income distribution with the olden days when data was not readily available and computers were not so sophisticated, you had um, income inequality or consumption inequality, just a few um, for, the, for the quintiles. And his method of how you can take just four observations on quintiles and from there develop 
um, in, a, in a very vigorous fashion um, the entire percentile distribution. So, um, you know, which actually helped me a lot. Uh, and in my book, the um, on poverty, um, imagine there's no country. So I owe a lot of debt to Nanakan for uh, having helped with that. Now, <clears throat> let me come to uh, two or three points. The first point I wanted to make was actually on the previous session um, where he talked about the multidimensional uh, poverty index and discussed. And I think, um, and, uh, you know, the, the simple point I want to make on that is that <clears throat> it was not at all clear to me, it's not necessarily what Nanak was saying, but as to what is the, the utility or what is the extra value added? How much you learn more from a multidimensional poverty index versus a very simple, straightforward uh, index, which is what income, um, income poverty or uh, consumption is us. Now let me get to, um, his talk today, and I think you know the this has been how to measure and what is poor poor growth um, has been a very very important uh, point, um, and uh, there was a whole set of uh, research that got spawned back in the early two thousand I believe on exactly. Contributions towards measurement of poor poor growth. Um, so that's another important development that has taken place. Now let me come to the you know poor poor versus inclusive and the distinction. It's not you know I let me offer in the spirit of Nanak's work. <clears throat> That I think, first of all, it is very important to understand and develop a distinction between poor, pro poor, and inclusive. Um, one simple measure that comes out that rather than uh, all the weight, and it's a matter of weights, um, but rather than all the weight being provided uh, to the poor, and then look, why not the following? It's so poor <clears throat> if the growth rate of the in income or consumption, whatever you're looking at, the average growth rate of the poor exceeds that of the average growth rate of the non-poor. One very, very straightforward. So you get uh, the group is into two groups, the poor and the non-poor, and at whatever poverty line, you want to do, and you look at the average growth rate over whatever period uh, of the poor and the average growth rate of the non-poor, the, if the, the poor growth rate is higher than that of the non-poor, then it's pro-poor growth. Then you want to get into uh, whether uh, it's inclusive or not. And I think one needs to um, perhaps develop this concept a bit more, but a very quick, um, you know, first of all, one should actually, what's the big, why isn't poor, poor inclusive? Inclusive term came much later than poor, poor. Um, and it's not clear that you know, if it's poor, poor, it's inclusive. Maybe Nana can develop an index of the relative growth rates of the poor versus the non-poor, and develop from there um, whether it is inclusive or not. I guess um, you know we want it. So a necessary condition for it to be inclusive 
is in my view, it has to go pro poor. After that, if the uh, growth rate of the uh, non-poor is somewhat close to, but some distance away from the poor growth, which is what you ideally want, I would call that inclusive. But I, all of this is an index, and Nanak is very, very uh, uh, familiar with uh, developing these indices. Um, so I think, and that's shared prosperity. You know, you don't want an economy. It's unsustainable if only the incomes of the poor grow and the incomes of the non-poor don't. So you want it as equal with a step jump up for the uh, for the poor. Now, in his, you know, and I had a discussion with him uh, on what's the story uh, with India. And unfortunately, we don't have the latest uh, unit level data uh, in order to find out whether what kind of growth has been experienced. But we can get some distance there by noting the following. What the, again, using the Takwani method for developing the percentile, for developing from the, uh, the aggregate data, the, you know, how each percentile has fared. <clears throat> what you get is that for the first time ever that I know of any country, inequality has actually gone down in India's case between 2011 and 2022-23. Okay, so we don't have the unit level data, but the unit level data, once available, will only marginally change the extremes and is very, very unlikely to, let us say, change the gene. Um, I haven't found it in my application of the Kapani method for uh, more than 1,000 or 1,500 country year observations. So, <clears throat> why this? remarkable uh, development has taken place. And this itself, India, uh, has often and correctly dominated the discussion in the world uh, on inequality, growth, pro-poor growth, etc. because Chinese data is not made available. So the Indian data are the only ones, and India is a large country. Um, and once, so, but you need the, the individual uh, unit level data in order to really firmly state that uh, what we have experienced in India is absolutely a remarkable event in terms of the inclusiveness of the growth and the poor nature of the growth. So, that's all the, uh, um, and, you know, I would think that I want to conclude that, you know, <clears throat> the, again, getting back to multidimensional poverty, which seems to be popular with Niti Ayog, whatever, I, I found it um, in my uh, discussion and utilization and examination of the multidimensional poverty index uh, of very, very little use. And I, I guess of negative value added in terms of looking at the indices of multidimensional poverty. Um, you gain less, you lose some, you gain less knowledge by looking at the various details of the multidimensional uh, poverty index. So we wait for the unit level data and we wait for uh, NADAC to develop uh, a, an index that I think, and which is already working on, on the shared prosperity, but a very simple, elegant, um, 
mathematical uh, formula for distinguishing between uh, pro poor and inclusive. There we go. Thank I'll you. stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Surjit. Uh, before I turn it over to questions, I just uh, uh, want to uh, add a small thing. You know, uh, in the old days, I used to be quite uh, uh, technically savvy. I'm no longer, let me admit that, in the <laughs> days when I worked with uh, Kenneth Arrow. Uh, so, so we had this very simple concept uh, called stochastic dominance, okay? Uh, uh, it's, it's simple, you take cumulative distribution uh, and draw a graph. And given the data which has come, uh, I have done that. And it turns out that as far as urban uh, consumption data is concerned, there's complete stochastic dominance of the 2022-3 data over 2011-12. You know what that means? That means there is no trade-off. We've done better on the urban side. In the uh, rural one, there is a slight glitch at one point. I think it's at uh, 30, uh, 20 to 30 uh, uh, proportion of the consumers, uh, but if, if, you know, which is very minor, it's point percentages. So if you ignore that little glitch, you again have the same result, uh, which seems to me a little different from what has just been talked about. Now, this is of course using the simple, uh, you know, 5% and 10% uh, stuff given. You've done a more uh, detailed, uh, so, so I just use the fractiles and I find the uh, uh, distribution has absolutely clearly <laughs> improved over time. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, we didn't have question, time for questions last time. We do have 15 minutes today. Uh, uh, would anybody like to ask questions? Uh, Professor Vishandas, you will have to look out for the questions in the chat box or somewhere, or is there anybody else there? Dr. Vishandas, are you there? Yes, okay. sir. I am. I am there. Okay. Uh, this this was very fascinating discussion. Uh, yeah. There are questions. I will pick uh, selectively because there are many. Uh, let, let me think, sir. One one is economic growth is contributed by this is sector of the economy with the distribution aspects are uh, with the household. How do you link the macro variable with from house? Household perspective. I have not fully claimed that I have understood, but whatever it means, yeah. whatever it means. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Maybe, Professor, you want to take a shot at that, whatever you want to say. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, shall I respond to the all questions or shall I go one? By Everything. One? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. And one question is Could you please elaborate a bit about the result that you got with India's growth is neither pro poor nor inclusive? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there is, and, uh, and uh, there is another question to Professor Kakwani Policy, would you like to tackle India's inequality issue and is showing an increasing trend? So these are the few questions I think uh, which which makes some sense. Uh, so either uh, uh, Dr. Bhalla or Kakwani who so can can respond. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sir. I think I, I think the, if too many questions come, I will forget to answer. So let's focus on whatever okay, okay. what has been asked already. Right. Uh -huh. First, you know, uh, compliment to Bala. He has made many useful points uh, about it. I, first, you know, uh, going back to my last lecture, uh, he said that why you are measuring multidimensional poverty at all? You know, why not uh, we we use the usual consumption and uh, uh, poverty which has been done in India all the time? And now the reason is that that the earlier poverty results as you know in my review of the literature i i talked about that they were not unidimensional poverty you know that the, you know the indian economy is many you know tandulkar and uh, dandekar rath and all that they proposed 
actually their uh, poverty was multidimensional. They were talking about expenditure on nutrition, health, education, and 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 so on. So, so it's not a unidimensional as you know as pointed out by you know uh, this. Uh, as pointed out by the uh, this uh, multidimensional poverty uh, uh, proposals, you know. Uh, so secondly, you know, what I was saying that they were only focusing, you know, the earlier studies, consumption poverty, they were mainly focused on nutrition, you know, that they were focused on you know, calories and you know, not so much on protein, only, only they were focused on calories. The idea was that Indian food was such that if you get the calories, the proteins are automatically, you know, uh, people get proteins, you know, depending on how many calories you are getting. So they didn't pay much attention to protein, but they did pay attention to the calories. Hmm? Actually, in my, you know, uh, uh, one of my recent papers, 2011, a new model of poverty, uh, I used the consumer theory. I was arguing that it's not the nutrition only, you know, it's not only the calories, you know, people consume because, you know, the people, when they become better off, their cost of calorie goes up. Not the number of the calories, but the cost of the calories. So cost of calorie, I, I related that cost of calorie was a very good indicator of measuring people's living, a standard of living. Because when you people become rich, they they eat rich food which has a lot of proteins, a lot of fat, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, it was the calorie, you know, that that increase in income was not related with calorie consumption, but it was related to calorie cost. You know, the how much cost they are. Supposing you know if you are eating in a restaurant, same calorie will <laughs> cost you twenty times more. <laughs> more than what you cook at home, you know, the food you cook at home. So the calorie cost, so you have not only have to know what is the required level of calories, but also how much is the cost of calories, how to calculate that. So in that paper, I have discussed that. But multidimensional poverty, my idea is that, that a household or person is poor if it cannot meet the basic capabilities. You know, basic capabilities. Now, basic capabilities uh, <clears throat> are the more general of what you know India has been doing before. You know that India has been focusing more on calorie, you know, nutrition, and some you know uh, allowance for clothing and and so on. But but basic capabilities are more general, you know, that can include the, you know, uh, deprivation in health, deprivation in education, deprivation in, you know, you have a transport. Or, uh, or I will say that if you are, you know, if a household, somebody falls sick in the household, and if you cannot afford to see a doctor, I will say that that person is deprived, you know. So you have to look at many dimensions of deprivations which can occur. And that is why we are talking about multidimensional poverty. But what Niti Ayod has done, they have followed the UNDP's, you know, the Global uh, Multidimensional Poverty Index, which is full of, you know, ad hoc assumptions and weights and all that is, you know, I mean, you know, that was, that had methodology has been very criticized in the literature, you know, the, the uh, debate on, in the gender of economic inequality. So, so I don't know why, because India was a leader in measuring poverty, and now they are measuring poverty using the UNDP's, you know, the very inferior uh, method of measuring multidimensional poverty. But what I have suggested in my paper last week was that we look at the capabilities. For instance, uh, we look at the cost of accessing the various capabilities. For instance, you know, supposing medical care, you know, how much is the cost to get all the medical care, uh, access to medical care? 
Now, that is, that's not very difficult to estimate because many insurance companies, you know, say in developed countries are US and uh, Australia and all that. They, they have, uh, you know, private companies, they provide you medical insurance and provide you access to different medical services. They estimate the average cost. So these costs can be available so that you don't have to go into each, each individual, you know, uh, uh, capability, uh, each individual variable, you know, uh, finance and education, for instance, if you get access, you know, if children are unable to attend the school, they are deprived, you know, because if they are not able to, uh, because they, their parents cannot afford to send them to school, they cannot afford to buy uniforms and shoes and, uh, and uh, uh, stationery and, you know, all that, children are deprived. So that is very important that we can easily calculate the cost, average cost of how much a child will cost, you know, to go to the school. So going to the school is important, but whether child will learn, uh, will complete this year seven or even year eight, that we don't know. Uh, whether how much the child will learn, because if quality of a school is very bad, I'm told that in India, the rural areas, the teachers don't come to the classes to teach, you know, so attending the uh, school is not just uh, enough, enough, but you have to make sure that uh, education, the, every child is provided some quality education so that they are learning, you know. So uh, access to clean water, uh, electricity and all that, you know, so that's why multidimensional poverty is important, but the way I do it, I don't wait, I give ad hoc weights. What I do is give, you know, calculate the cost of access to various services. I mean, government provides many services. I mean, uh, they, they charge fees, some fees, so you can, fee can go in the poverty line. So what I'm doing is that measure, follow the old method, calculate the poverty line, which provides you access to all the basic capabilities. You know, that's a very simple idea. Actually, going back to what has been happened, happened in India, you know, uh, they, they have been following that. Uh, about other questions, uh, about this today's discussion, that why don't we measure, you know, separately, you know, that get a look at the growth rate of the poor and non-poor and all that. Uh, I would say that, you know, that growth is uh, very important, you know, that it provides the means to people to achieve better life, you know. So growth is very important. So what I'm doing is linking uh, poverty, inequality with growth, you know. Then, then we, we, you know, that the result I have got is that if there is a you know gain in the growth rate, you know, growth rate, then it is pro poor or anti, and when there's a loss, it is anti poor. So you can calculate how much is the contribution of uh, distribution in the total. You know, so say grow, growth is supposing uh, India's growth is say 8.4 percent, and then 5 percent is lost because distribution is not you know is, uh, is lopsided. That, that means that that tells you something more than what we can do by indi measuring individually, you know. So, so, so linking is very important to me. Huh? I hope that uh, I'm able to answer uh, Sujit's uh, uh, question he raised on that. So basically I'm following the same method as people have been following in India on poverty measurement, consumption poverty, but I'm extending it. Pardon? Yes. Nothing. There's some disturbance. Yeah. 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 Continue. Yeah. So I'm extending it to many dimensions, you know, rather than uh, restrict to the few dimensions. So, so okay. I don't know why okay. poverty in India, poverty in India provided leadership in measuring poverty. Many, you know, committees are formed and uh, Tandulkar and, uh, you know, Dandekar Rathan. Everybody was quoting when I was at the World Bank, we were working on that. 
But why it is all disappeared completely and then are following the UNDP's very inferior method of measuring poverty, you know? Thank you. Yeah, you've already raised that last time. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Ashok? Uh, yes. We have about four minutes. Should I, uh, is there one more question perhaps we can take? Yeah. Uh, is, is the poverty directly proportional to employment opportunity generated due to capitalistic and socialistic policy and legislation? Again, is this related to political ideology? You are you, you sir. Uh, I mean, I, you know, my, you know, framework I'm giving is nothing to do with the politics of ideology and all that. What I'm doing is simple idea, the social welfare function and how to link the policies with that, you know? For instance, you know, uh, employment, you know, that if you generate employment, huh, how much, employment has impact on shared prosperity or how much labor force participation has impact on shared prosperity, you know, our productivity, you know, that education, you know, uh, in say Brazil, the work I did in Brazil that, you know, uh, showed me that the reduction in inequality was not due to ideology or so social policies. It was mainly because they expanded the education and then, you know, expanded the education for the lower income people, for the unskilled, uh, unskilled, unskilled people. And also they in kept increasing their minimum wage, you know, the you know, labor market, you know, the minimum wage and all that, you know. So, so my framework provides you a lot of information how to formulate evidence-based policies, not ideologically, uh, not all that, that, you know, Niti Ayuk's what it suggests is that they are, this is the cocktail of policies and they will achieve inclusive growth. But that's not, you know, I mean, uh, the idea. The idea is that we look at them and define, first you have to define what is inclusive growth and what is, you know, uh, uh, pro poor growth and then how to connect these policies with them, you know. Um, about the Sujit Bala's policy, so I'm giving all the weights to the poor and, you know, inclusive growth. Idea of inclusive growth is that we, you know, inclusive growth mainly captures the inequality, okay? And pro poor growth captures mainly, uh, mainly the poverty. So there are two, two distinct, you know, things, you know, they capture, okay? Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, uh, uh, Sujit, uh, final comments, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Vishundas. Yeah, uh, no, just very briefly, uh, the, um, you know, with the, again, for whatever index that we have, you want to reduce it um, in an Occam's way as a fashion to find out. So the only, I'd like to just make one point when, you have on the education sector of the multidimensional poverty, um, okay. how that is measured. And, you know, education and health have real problems at ceiling levels and at uh, floor levels. And it's very, very hard to get much information out. But anyway, this is more for, um, you know, once you get to 100%, um, how do you measure further? Uh, so you go to the higher edge. All I'm saying is that with the multidimensional poverty, breaking it up into health, education, and other variables, health and education are really, really problematic to do, measure change. So, but let's leave that for another occasion. Um, I think the pro poor versus inclusive um, is a much more exciting uh, area to do research on. Okay, thank you, thank you Sujit. Uh, Dr. Vishal Das. Can I? Uh, no, yes, okay. yes, sir. Alvin, yeah. can I quickly respond to your comment? You talk about stochastic dominance, you know? Huh? Yeah. I mean, shared prosperity, uh, I can also uh, talk about stochastic dominance, you know? with the shared prosperity, prosperity, because I'm assuming specific social welfare functions. Yeah. But yeah. when you have a stochastic dance dominance, you don't have to assume no, social to. welfare functions. Okay? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. A difference. That is the difference between the two. But yeah. then 
if the curves intersect in the stochastic dominance, then you cannot make any conclusion, you know. Absolutely. Uh, but so what that's I'm, I'm, absolutely, sir. Thank you for telling the people. This is, <laughs> I okay. learned that uh, 30 years ago and I remembered after Dr. Balla gave me some calculations on, <laughs> on poverty from the latest stuff. But thanks, Sajid, you've given a lot of data to me, but it's become yeah. very useful. But that's a separate discussion also. Uh, yes, absolutely. If you don't have stochastic dominance, then you need a weighting. That's absolutely correct. But Sujit, mm. your point about poverty and inclusion, the stock, you know, if the stochastic dominance is there in the poor, then that you're, you're kind of right. Because as long as your curve is uh, outside or better, uh, just to put it for everybody, at least up to the 30 or 40 percent, and maybe it goes off a little bit on that, you can be assured that poverty at least has improved. So yeah, the point what you've taken is kind of there in the stochastic dominance. But again, I think uh, I, I think we had a good discussion today. So uh, let me conclude and thank everybody and hand it to Dr. Vishindas. You have to make some announcements and stuff. Please go ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so, I sent you an email today. Can you respond to me when you have time? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So th thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are very audible. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, this was very, very interesting webinar. And uh, on behalf of EGRO and on my own behalf, I thank you, the chairman, Dr. Arvind Virmani, the lead discussant, Dr. Ballaji, and then uh, uh, Professor Nanak Kakwani. This is a, such a comprehensive and very insightful uh, exposition on uh, shared prosperity, the non-poor, the poor gets zero, and then you made it very clear that it's it's a uh, inclusive growth is not elusive. So that's the key message. I I'm sure the uh, audience is carrying, and the measurement and policy implication those are very wide. You made it very clear. I think you made it as as clear as crystal. And then intervention by our this by Dr. Surjit Balla was very phenomenal and very useful. Dr. Arvind Urmani, as usual, gives very very new insights and very powerful and profound. And all of us were enriched by th three leading panelists i would say the speakers and i'm sure all the uh, uh, audience got benefited and thanks once again for all your time and uh, your energy for making the things very very clear and you added the new dimension new perspective on this now just before i conclude i just want to tell the on the next friday that is May 3rd, we'll be holding another webinar at 4 p.m. The topic is Supreme Court and India's economy. And the, the speaker will be Sri Pirdeep Mehta, who is the founder and secretary general of Consumer Unity and Trust Society Cards. I request all the participants who have participated to please join on 4 p.m. That day we are going to start at 4 p.m. And thanks once again to the uh, Eminent panelists and the speaker, Professor Nana Kakwani, the chairman of the, this session, Dr. Arvind Virmani, and the lead discussant, Dr. Sujit Bhalla. And thanks once again to the to the audience also. So we now call it a day. And thanks once again to you. So so this webinar now comes to an end. Thank you very much. We are now leaving.